Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Tuesday, June 11th, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we prepare for another uh, market open. Um, we are now into the second week of June, and the second week of just about every calendar month means CPI and PPI reports coming out. So we got the CPI report coming out tomorrow morning. PPI report will be out on Thursday morning. And of course, right now we have a Fed meeting kicking off this morning. It's a two-day meeting, so we will get a policy statement tomorrow, uh, Wednesday at uh, 2, 2 p.m. Eastern. That'll be uh, several hours after the Fed. Uh, well, I'm sure the Fed's already digesting the CPI report, but uh, probably about five or six hours after we get the uh, May CPI report. Expectations currently are for the headline number to rise just one tenth of one percent, but the core number is expected to rise three tenths of one percent. And uh, this is one of the last uh, really positive um, numbers that we'll be able to go up against. So last year at this time, the May 2023 CPI report came in a little bit hotter, but the three after that, starting June, July, and August um, of 2023, were much lower. So the uh, comparisons for this year are going to be a little bit more difficult. This one, though, um, if we do come in at the consensus number, 0.3% or below, that will uh, lower our annual core rate of inflation uh, to its lowest level uh, since uh, you know we went up and hit 6.6, 6.7. So we continue to move in that right direction down. But I'm sure the Fed realizes that uh, the next few meetings or the next few readings are going to be a little bit difficult on a comparative basis. So uh, I'm not sure what they're going to say today. I don't believe they're going to cut. I'd like to see them have a surprise cut. I don't think they will. Uh, the market's not looking for them to cut today. We're expecting same old, same old. And then it'll come down once again to what they have to say. Are they going to you know, take the dovish route? Um, talking about some of the things that have transpired over the last month that have been weaker than expected, showing that the economy is slowing, um, or are they going to look at that jobs report from last week where the numbers came in much hotter than expected and say, hey, the economy is still strong. Uh, we still don't have inflation where we want it. And therefore, we're just going to maintain and continue to watch and Oh, by the way, we think we're going to we're going to cut next, but there's still a chance that we, you know, same old, same old. But uh, I think it's going to come down to that. Um, we do have some room on the 10 year Treasury yield, which I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. But uh, the 10 year Treasury yield has come down. Of course, when the Fed raises or cuts, it's not the 10 year yield. They're looking at short term rates. It's the Fed funds rate. But what they have to say has a lot to do with how the 10 year responds. So if it's more inflationary, if they talk more about inflation, they talk more about uh, the hot jobs report, then we're probably going to see the yield or the uh, 10 year treasury bond sell off and yields go up. Um, and 370 is a level I'd watch to the upside, um, or excuse me, 470. Uh, I wish it was 370. Uh, 470 will be an area of uh, yield resistance that we'll wanna watch to the downside. Uh, if they talk dovishly and they say, well, you know, we're, things are pointing to a cut and we see one coming and they give us a date, that sort of thing, I think the market, stock market would react pretty positively to that. And I also think we probably see uh, some buying in the, in the treasuries, sending those treasury yields lower. But that's what's coming tomorrow um, with the uh, actual announcement. But today they are starting the meeting. And uh, that's going to be the big news of the week. Hardly anything out in terms of earnings. We have a couple of software companies. Uh, we've got Oracle and we've got Adobe Systems reporting this week. And then we have Broadcom in that semiconductor space. And that literally is just about it. So there's not a whole lot in the way of earnings this week. Um, and so a lot of eyes are going to be on what the Fed has to say and on the CPI and PPI reports. All right. Anyhow, let's uh, take a look at... Uh, what happened uh, yesterday to start the week. Um, see if we can get those charts up. Um, Tyler, if you're there, if you could put that, there we go. 
Um, got the Dow Jones Industrial. Let me uh, zero in here, get a little closer. Um, so the Dow Jones up 69 points yesterday, back to the 38,868 level, still just hovering right here around these moving averages. You can see the 50 day sitting at 38,766. The 20 days at 38,904, and we're sitting almost squarely between the two, uh, closing at 38,868. So we'll have to see whether or not we can get that uh, breakout. I mean, we do have, you know, somewhat equal highs, a little bit higher high here at 40,000. That was a few weeks ago where we closed at that 40,003 level. First time and only time we've seen a close over 40,000. Came back down, we put in a little bit of a higher low, and now we're challenging, trying to get back through the moving averages but so far unsuccessful in doing so. S&P 500 rising another 14 points yesterday. We didn't hit an all-time high, but we did hit a closing all-time high. So intraday, I think the day before, uh, maybe on Friday, I believe we got up to 53.75. Yesterday, we didn't get up that high, but we did close at the highest level at 53.60, almost 53.61. Again, that was a gain of almost 14 points or a quarter of 1%. The uh, NASDAQ 100 uh, rising a bit more. The NDX jumping 74 points. That was up about four-tenths of 1%. And you can see closing at 19074. That was yet another all-time high close on the NASDAQ 100. But like the S&P 500, didn't get an intraday high. Uh, Mid-caps rising five and a half points. That was two-tenths of 1%. And small caps, uh, 72 cents. That was about a third of 1%. So we we're up across the board there, but not really. I mean, everything was fractional. So it wasn't huge gains, but still gains nonetheless. Transports rising 136 points. That was up nine tenths of 1%, closing at 15,159, which was just slightly above the 20 day of 15,155. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we were kind of toying with getting above that 20 day a week ago, a week and a half ago, came right back down. Now we're up here trying it again. Obviously, transports remain the weak link. Um, but if we could kind of get things going, maybe get back up above the early June high and get through that 50-day moving average, maybe that would be a start, but still got some work to do there. Um, before I go into the sectors, I will give you the uh, futures this morning. They are down, or at least they were down this morning. Not a lot, uh, but let's see. Diamonds, which track the Dow Jones down uh about one third of 1%. The uh, Spider tracking the S&P 500 down about one third of 1%. QQQ tracking the NASDAQ 100 down just a little bit more than one third, 1%. One All of those pretty much uh, hand in hand lockstep this morning. But the IWM is down a little bit more, down 1.1%. So given back pretty much everything it gained, it gapped down yesterday, had a pretty nice day right up until the close. And now we're gapping down, going right back down to where we were. Um, before the move back to the upside. So not a very good start, at least in futures for the IWM. This is an area that I've talked about a lot. I know a lot of members still with questions, what I think about the IWM. Um, I think I've lost a little bit of confidence because the yields coming down the last time really didn't send the IWM up. Um, I'm not ready to write the group off. Uh, I think they showed, IWM showed a lot of positives uh, back coming out of the low of October of last year. Um, but it has definitely lost some of that momentum versus those large cap growth names, the QQQ and the Spider. So it's kind of a mixed bag for me. I haven't really changed anything in terms of my allocations, but I'm watching things pretty closely. If the Fed tomorrow does talk dovishly and the, the yields uh, come down and we're still not seeing a move from that IWM, uh, that would be concerning to me for sure. Um, as I've said all along, I think it's it makes sense to be in the QQQ, the I, or the uh, S and P, the Spider, and also the IWM. For me, though, it comes down to the weighting, and I did have more, do have more in the IWM um, uh, than I normally would have. So um, the overweighting there certainly has not paid dividends for me at this point. But you know, if you go back to 2022, it's really hard to catch exact bottoms, whether it's in an individual stock, whether it's in an index, whatever. Um, back in 2022, I really liked the QQQ in June. Um, I, I, well, I called bottom in the S&P 500, but I also 
pointed out that the the uh, rates, you know, I thought once we got back past all of the inflation scare and rates, you know, started to mod moderate a little bit, which they did and they continued to move higher. But I kind of liked the uh, growth stocks and that's why I thought the QQQ would have a good year in 2023. And then we saw that, but it didn't start in 2022. It didn't start in June. Uh, we actually went down lower in October of 2022. So again, trying to call exact bottoms is not that easy. Um, the one thing that I would say that bothers me a little bit more this time than in 2022 is that the intraday activity on the IWM has turned back down. And we didn't see that as much on the QQQ. The QQQ continued to look like it was being manipulated, like there was a lot of accumulation in the stocks represented in the QQQ. That was 2022. 2024, not seeing that same um, intraday bullishness in the IWM. And that to me definitely is uh, somewhat concerning. So, I mean, I'm gonna stick with the IWM a little bit longer and give it a chance here, but I'm, I don't blame anyone uh, that moves away from it, moves back to the QQQ where a lot of the leadership lies. A lot of those large cap semiconductor names couple of the software names. I know CrowdStrike really starting to light it up here of late. Um, that's another one. That one's in our portfolio, one of our portfolios. So that's been a good thing. But uh, yeah, IWM for now, uh, I think at best is probably neutral. And we'll see what happens coming out of this Fed meeting, whether or not we can see some uh, momentum return to that small cap area. Utilities uh, among the sectors uh, gaining nine, 90 cents, 92 cents actually, uh, jumping 1.32% yesterday, still overall in a downtrend in my view. We did get back up to 70.86, which was just below the 20-day moving average. But can we get back through it, make a move, and eventually break out above 73? That's what we're looking for, for a more, more bullish outcome on the XLU. But for now, let's see if we get through that 20-day. Energy gaining 71 cents. That was up about 8 tenths of 1%. But the downtrend clearly is in play. Lower lows, lower highs, a channel. Um, I think getting back up to the 20 or slightly above is fine. Really to straighten out this chart, we need to get back through about 95, 95 and a half. Because that is, if you look at this as a lower low, lower high pattern, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low. And maybe that you call as the lower high, but I would probably go just down to this right here. One, two, three lows. And then uh, one, two, and then wherever we finish here would be the third low. I think to get back through the channel, you'd probably have to get back through about 93, 93 and a half. But to really reverse this uh, pattern of lower lows, lower highs, I think the XLE has got to get back up above that 95 to 95 and a half area. So not very good there. And in terms of the um, AD line, that is one positive that I should point out on the XLE because it does look like even though we keep going to these lower lows, you can see that the uh, AD line has actually remained pretty strong. So I give the XLE a pretty decent chance, more so than if the, the AD line was going down, but I give it a pretty good chance to break this uh, move to the downside. I believe energy will hold $70 a barrel. We've been rising back up again lately, back to around 77 a barrel. Um, I, I think we're going to get a break to the upside in energy coming up. I don't know that it'll be a leader, but I think it'll perform well. But it, we got to get through the numbers I mentioned. XLRE, real estate, another key area of the market that was higher yesterday. It's defensive. So we have utilities, we had real estate, and we had energy as our three best sectors on a day when we set a new all-time high. Not a great look. I think overall we're doing okay in the market. Every area of the market seems to be trending higher. We don't have any major breakdowns uh, among our sectors. So as a result, I think that uh, the market's still in a pretty good position. Um, if we start to break down, you know, again, Fed meeting today and tomorrow, got the May PPI, or excuse me, May CPI uh, out tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning, and then the May PPI will be out on Thursday morning. So we got a lot going on here over the next couple of days. If the market does, you know, take a big drop and we start seeing breakdowns, that would be a signal that maybe we've got more weakness ahead. But until I see that, as long as I see the market holding up and most of the areas continuing to trend at or above their, their key moving averages, I'm, it's hard to bet against a secular bull market. Uh, I've said that probably since June 
of 2022. Even when we were in that cyclical bear market, I said, we're still in a secular bull. Might be a cyclical bear, short-term bear, but we're in a long-term bull. And I think these last two years have kind of proved me correct on that as we've moved back up to all-time highs. Um, but let's, you know, before you get too bearish, you got to see some breakdowns. Price volume is the number one indicator. So we can talk about defensive groups all day long if we want leading. And I said this back in 2022, by the way, when I was calling a top, that we still needed to see a breakdown. We had a lot of things lining up bearishly, but we still needed to see a price breakdown to confirm. And we ended up getting that, I think, in February, later in January or February 2022. Anyhow, we need that. We need to see that price breakdown. We're not seeing it. So I will stick to the long side until something happens um, in terms of uh, bearish. Something bearish happens uh, to the price action or or volume, heavy volume of companies, some, a big breakdown, something like that. Um, this was an interesting leader among the industry groups yesterday, asset managers. And I say that because the financial sector was the worst sector um, in yesterday's action. And yet asset managers were among our best individual groups, um, industry groups, but still work to do. You can see we're still in this downtrend. So yes, it felt good to have that move up to 293.94. But if you look where the 50-day and the 20-day reside, we're sitting almost right on them. 293.21 is the 50-day, 293.90 is the 20-day, and we're at 293.94. So we need to see some follow-through here. Um, we'll see whether or not it happens today. Um, oil services, uh, DJUSOI, uh, this was another strong group, but bouncing off support, which is a good thing, but we got a lot of work to do overhead. First, got to get through the 20-day, which we've been failing at over the course of the last few weeks. If we can get through the 20, then we might have, have a chance. You can see again, like the XLE, uh, the AD line here on the oil services area, turning back up again and not too far from taking out prior highs. So I don't think the AD line looks very bad here. Anyway, something just to keep in mind. And, uh, oh, I somehow skipped over the renewable energy, but renewable energy had a big day yesterday. First solar trying to break out and phase energy, I think was up about eight or nine bucks. Um, so we're starting to see much more bullish action in this. Um, I will uh, take a look at a uh, one of the stocks here in this group uh, when we get to the uh, um, EB digest uh, kind of chart of the day, if you will. All right, let's move on to the 10 year treasury yield. So this will be worth watching here over the next couple of days to see how the bond market reacts to not only the Fed, but also to these big CPI and PPI reports coming up this week. But right now we're down just a tad today, uh, down a couple basis points, 4.4, uh, 4.45 it looks like, um, zero in here over on the right side of the chart. So you can see we're right up in here in these the middle of these moving averages with the uh, 50 and 20 coming in, right at about 4.50% and 4.45% respectively. And that's where we're currently residing at, toward that 20 um, day EMA right now. So not a whole lot there to talk about other than what's coming up. Let's see how we react. It looks to me like in the short term, we got a little bit of a downtrend, but I would still say the more intermediate term is in an uptrend. And I'm not sure which one continues after the Fed. Maybe, maybe we just sit in the middle here and it's just more sideways action. Um, I will tell you that I, I, I really do like the way the volatility index has been acting, the VIX, which is still under 13, 1274. So we've had that, we had the big move where we dropped from up near 20 all the way down to 11 and a half, rose back up near 15 when we saw a little bit of market weakness. And now we're coming right back down again. So back into the 12s. Um, if you're new to the show or new to earnings beats, new to the VIX um, and, and how you can use this, I view the volatility index as um, kind of a signal from the market makers. Um, when we get, I, I like to look at the equity only put call ratio, but that's more a signal of the complacency or the pessimism among retail options traders. This is more designed as a, a signal from the market makers because they price options. They set the premiums on options and particularly the S&P 500 options, which is what goes into this calculation. Anytime the volatility index is low, thinking below 13, 
uh, as lower it gets, 12, 11, 10, 9 even, um, that's telling us that market makers are setting very, very small premiums. So in other words, options are getting very cheap. They wouldn't do that if we're going to see this huge route to the downside. Um, they would be anticipating more volatility and they would price these options higher. Um, one other point with the VIX is I've done studies and the throughout this secular bull market since 2013, anytime the VIX is below 13, the stock market tends to do much, much better. It's very, very bullish. Um, the action that we typically see when the VIX resides below 13. It's still bullish even if it resides below 17, but it's really bullish when it goes below 13. So having a VIX down this low makes me feel more like the market is, is probably going to continue this churn for now to the upside. But we do have the Fed. We've got an interest rate um, announcement tomorrow. We got the CPI coming up, then the PPI follows it. So there's a lot that maybe could change the scenario, but at least for now, the market is anticipating not a whole lot of volatility ahead, which I think is good. Uh, speaking of the S&P 500 and its volatility, you can kind of see um, not a whole lot of big candles, red, um, red filled, which would be selling all day, or even hollow. We've had a couple of decent hollow candles, had a nice hammer that printed on the 20 day moving average. If I really zero in here, you can see that hammer that printed. Um, it looked like we were falling apart intraday and then came right back and that led. Anytime you get a downtrend and you get a big selling uh, event in the morning and then you get a big afternoon reversal, that is a reversing type of candle. And we should expect higher prices after that. And that's what we've seen. Move back up to all time highs. We do still have that negative divergence, but the PPO is rising. And if all of a sudden we caught fire and moved up two or three days in a row, get back up, say, above 5,400, it's possible that this uh, negative divergence uh, begins to be eliminated. Um, and if that happens, all of a sudden the momentum issues are out the window. We don't have to worry about that. Um, I don't believe we have any sentiment issues to deal with at this point. So all of a sudden it just looks like a market that wants to continue to push higher, even if it is, you know, you know if there are somewhat... Um, suspect or suspicious um, rotation that we're seeing because they're still, you know, we're having days where we see really nice leadership from growth. And then we're having other periods where we're still seeing utilities and real estate lead like yesterday. So, you know, which is it? I'm not sure. But what I can tell you is that everything still remains in a bullish uptrend, just about every area of the market. And like I said, sentiment is not a problem for the market at all right now. And that was a big problem back at the end of 2021, if you recall. Uh, so anyway, that's the S&P. Other indexes are very similar, uh, at least the NASDAQ 100 breaking to a new all-time high, still with a negative divergence, but this one wouldn't take as much to eliminate it. So keep an eye on that. A lot of times people call for you know, negative divergences, got to get out of the market, get out of the market, and they could either be uh, eliminated or as we saw back in February, March, and April, you just continue pushing higher as the PPO comes down. Then we had one little hit. We're back down below the zero line and then right back up with price action and the PPO. So, I, and again, this level right here at 1.5 is not a very high level to see a negative divergence print. Um, usually it's at least up at two, maybe two and a half or even three before we get a more meaningful. I mean, if you look back in July last year, let's stretch this out just a little bit idea of what I'm talking about here. But if as we were going up, you can see how we set this high at three on the PPO. And then we came down and we went back up the next time. You can see the PPO only got to two and a half. And then we started to roll over. And then right here, when you break the 20 day and you also lose that area of support, that's when you start to get more signs of, okay, probably more serious weakness ahead. And you can see what we ended up doing. We played out into a correction over the next couple of months, not seeing any of that price action yet. So I'd be careful about being too premature and trying to call a market top. I do see one coming this summer though. Um, and I think it will probably relate more as we get closer to the election and the uncertainty that always surrounds elections. Um, it is typical in a presidential election year 
to see weakness later in maybe July, August, September time, uh, that time period. So June 10th or 11th might be a little early for it, um, but we'll keep watching. Obviously, if we get the breakdown, then we got to worry about something. If we don't, stick with this market. IWM, uh, a little bit of a double top. I've talked about this recently, not really going to keep going into it. We did gap down yesterday with a really nice recovery, and it looks like we're going to gap down right to where we were yesterday. So, and if you look at this on a five, uh, five day, 10 minute chart, you'll see that we have, since we rolled over here, we've been putting in lower lows and lower highs. So lower lows and lower highs on June 6th, which was last Thursday, last Friday, lower lows, lower highs. And even yesterday, though we were rallying all day long, the high was below the high on uh, Monday, or excuse me, on Friday, and the low was below. So as we gap down here, back down, this pattern still remains in play. So we're going to return back to the upside again after this gap down this morning. I don't know. We'll find out starting in about five minutes. <clears throat> Transports, nice day, nice recovery. We have had four hollow candles since this low back in May, four decent hollow candles to the upside and only two filled to the downside. I don't know if we need to make anything of that just yet. I would really like to see a move back up above the 50-day moving average. So we get a definitive move above the 50 day and you can see the last couple of months, we've just about lived beneath the 50 day moving average. So let's get above the 50. Let's get that PPO into positive territory. Until then, I think it's you, you have to respect the downtrend that's still in place, at least on the daily chart. All right, moving on to the chart of the day, the EB Digest. Um, that's uh, what we issue three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. But on our Tuesday and Thursday shows, we like to give you a chart of the day uh, as well. So if you scroll down and you want to become part of our EB Digest community, there is an area on the left side of the screen that you can fill out with your name, email address right here and hit that subscribe button and, and check it out. It's a very quick read. So if you're thinking, oh, no, it's a newsletter. I don't need another newsletter. It's really just um, an educational two paragraph, one chart kind of a deal. Um, and again, comes out Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then we also talk about something on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, but uh, check it out. Um, it not only gets you our, our uh, um, three times a week newsletter and chart, but it also sets you up for any free events that we do. We'll reach out to our entire community. And we have tens of thousands of folks um, that have subscribed to our EB Digest. So uh, you'll be joining a lot of uh, like-minded traders and investors just looking for something to help in their uh, trading success. Um, if you'd like to try us out, 30-day free trial, um, you can uh, start your that trial here. Um, that is a paid service. You will have to give credit card. The EB Digest, no credit card required. You can uh, subscribe, unsubscribe at any time. All right, so I wanted to give you a, a chart of one of those... Um, uh, renewable energy stocks. And it's one I've been kind of watching for a while, Enphase Energy. It continues to be somewhat volatile. It looked like maybe we were picking up, saw the volume pick up. Let's zero in here on this right side of the chart. You can kind of see things are picking up. We got a nice trend line, maybe even a channel that's kind of underway. We saw weakness on Friday, didn't look very good, closed below the 20 day and then came right back up, which is what you want to see. Last time we came down just below the 20 day, you can see the buyers came in in full force. Um, we've had a few of these days where we've had really nice, big, uh, decent volume moves to the upside. You can see yesterday's volume was just kind of moderate. A couple of these over here though, you can see pretty heavy volume. So it looks like maybe we're getting a little bit of accumulation, but that AD line still weak on the stock. Uh, you can see that down here, but I'm just talking visually at these candles. I like to see these um, these filled candles, or excuse me, these hollow candles, long hollow candles, and especially on volume that's telling me that we're getting some accumulation. The reason the AD line isn't really reacting quite as strong is that remember, the AD line is based on where we close relative to where we trade that day. So the fact that a couple of these big volume candles in here have tails to the top, they're not getting quite the positive reaction on the AD line. I still see really solid hollow candles, which I think is important 
uh, in terms of accumulation. But the way the the actual um, formula works for the AD line, you don't get as much pop when you have a little bit of um, upside intraday action where you come back down at the end of the day. Um, and then we have some days in here where we simply close at the midpoint or below, um, even though we've been going up. So we gap up, we don't follow through. We gap down, we close near the low. We gap up, leave the tail at the top. We gap up, we close in the bottom half. We gap up, we close down near the low. We move up a little bit intraday, but we close in the middle, right about in the middle of the candle. So that's what's driving that AD line to the downside. But what we needed a few more candles like this, hollow candles with breakouts. We'll see whether or not we get them. Well, if we get it here. Um, but that I do like the kick saves off the 20 day. If we roll back over and fail to hold the 20 and move back down below the 50, the run is probably over. But right now, it still does look like we're somewhat bullish. All right, it is 9.30 right on the button. So let's see um, what we got going on in the market here. Um, that is today, I believe. Let's just get an update. Yep, so we are down a half of 1% on the Dow, um, about three-tenths of 1% S&P 500. NASDAQ doing a little bit better on a relative basis again. Small caps actually looks like maybe rallied back a little bit. Not really seeing anything yet on the visual over here, but we were down over 1%. Now we're down seven-tenths of 1%. Maybe we'll get another rally back. Who knows? Uh, VIX, though, is up a little bit back up above the 13 level. Don't let above 13 scare you, though. 13, 17, still very, very strong action in the market when we're in that range. It's just below 13, we do even better. So a uh, move back up and then maybe a, a drop back down below 13, I think would be a good thing for the market. Anyhow, that's about it. Uh, by the way, I had a great weekend this weekend. I want to thank all of our members for your patience. Um, uh, some of the things that I normally do on the weekend, like chart list, updating the chart list, there really wasn't a whole lot to update. There weren't many earnings reports last week. We got a few more this week. I'll get everything updated this week. We should also have new data on the short squeeze uh, coming out this week. And as a result, hopefully should have um, the latest there for everyone on the short squeeze chart list as well. Um, but everything should be caught up this week and uh, we can go from there. Anyhow, listen, have a great day, everybody. I will be back uh, tomorrow for the next Trading Places Live at 9 a.m. Eastern. And then at 9.30, or excuse me, at 10, we will have our live trading room. So if you've missed these, you want to attend, all it takes is a 30-day trial, 30-day free trial right here. Start your no-cost trial. And uh, again, 30 days will get you five um, Wednesdays. So that would be five live trading rooms. Check us out. I think you're gonna, you'd love the service. Anyway, have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.